Welcome everybody to our AP Bio lesson for today. I'm hoping I can get this one done in one video. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about eukaryotic genomes today. This is a little bit strange. This is part of chapter 15. It's included with some other stuff, but uh, like I said before, it's uh, I sort of went out of order and jumped around a little bit, but um, we'll get started. So eukaryotic DNA is controlled a lot differently than bacterial DNA. Um, for one, the biggest issue with eukaryotic DNA is there's tons of it and you need to do something to package it. It just would not fit if you just let it hang out there and um, just be unwound. So we have this ability to package our DNA um, and there's lots of proteins involved. And the most important protein is this one called histones right here. Okay, histones are the ones that DNA winds around. There's also these other ones called nucleosomes. There's all these different layers. I'm not worried that you know what these different layers are, but realize that you wind them and then you wind them again. Um, and I'll have some images here. So um, gene expression in eukaryotic organisms is a little bit complicated. We obviously know we have many, many different types of cells in our bodies. And th what is a little strange is that they all contain exactly the same DNA. It's a matter of what genes are turned on in a cell that makes a cell act the way that it does. So understanding how this works is incredibly important and incredibly complicated. So I don't want you to give you the impression that you're gonna learn everything there is to know. There are people that spend a lifetime trying to figure this out. Um, and there are many different points along that path where you can actually regulate this. Um, so here is the general path going from DNA all the way to proteins and beyond. So we start up here, we have the DNA, and this is the idea of packaging the DNA. And so if it's tightly packed, it's unlikely to get used. So that is a strategy that many cells use is areas of the DNA that we don't want to use. We just package up tightly and it never gets used. Um, we can regulate transcription. This is a big one and we'll talk a little bit more about it. Uh, in eukaryotic organisms, we can regulate what we process as far as the RNA, how we do that. Some organisms and some, in some examples, we actually store some of the messenger RNA inside the nucleus, which means it doesn't get transcribed, sorry, it's transcribed already, but it doesn't get translated. So we store it there until we're ready to uh, ship it out to the cell. We can regulate translation in some ways. We can actually control how long the messenger RNA lasts, because if it's if we only want the protein to be made for a little bit, we we break down the messenger RNA right away. If we want it to be made for a long time, we keep that messenger RNA going. Um, we can also process the proteins and we can also transport that to different areas and degrade the proteins. So a lot of different steps along the way. So one of the big ones is this thing called histone acetylation. It's a big fancy word. And it, um, we talked about it briefly in the biochemistry unit. Um, so acetylation basically loosens the chromatin. So um, when you have really tightly coiled DNA, it just does not transcribe. Um, and when we acetylate it, it loots, loosens up the chromatin and allows you to actually transcribe it. There's an opposite process called methylation of histones, and that does the exact opposite. It kind of packages the DNA so it will not get used. Um, and it can be semi-permanent. Um, this is one of the reasons why we think it is difficult for us to take a certain types of cells and turn them into other cells because some of their DNA is methylated and you just can't open up those, those genes, okay? Um, so a good example of this methylation is that DNA, the bar body situation, we talked about that in the calico cats where they actually destroy, well not destroy, they basically um, block one of their X chromosomes from actually being used. Um, 
and um, lots of different environmental factors may affect whether we, what gets transcribed and translated. These are histones, um, and you can see the DNA is coiled around here. It does two coils around these histones, and you see that we actually, um, <clears throat> here is the example of, this is unacetylated histones. There's no way we could ever transcribe this DNA. This is the acetylated histones and you can see that it's a little more open and we could actually get this DNA to transcribe and eventually get translated. Um, so regulation and transcription is a big one. We talked about operons with bacteria and you did a pogo on operons. This is a little bit different. We, um, we use these molecules called control elements. Uh, it's similar idea to the idea of a, a promoter but it is we need these things called transcription factors and you have lots of them in your cells and basically what makes a cell different is the set of transcription factors that are out there um, and we we do we have it's a complicated process we have these things called control elements um, and they bind to activator proteins and promote transcription we also have repressors out there. It's very similar to this, but I'll show you what's different. And it's a little easier to show in an image. But um, what we have is this is our gene of interest. Okay, remember we have the exons, which are the areas that we want, the introns that are going to get cut out. Um, we have at the end a termination region that tells us to stop um, when we are transcribing it. And then we have this promoter region. That's usually where you have the Tata box. And then you have these things called proximal control elements right next to it. So that's all right next to the gene. But then we have, and this is the real kind of unique part about eukaryotic, we have these upstream enhancers. And so you can see there's a break in DNA. This can vary how far away it is from the gene, but it is not right at the gene. Okay, and in order for this gene to be transcribed, we actually need these enhancers and these proximal control elements to all be turned on. Okay, um, and then eventually we're gonna, if we when we do transcribe that, we're gonna have to cut out those introns. We're gonna have to put on a, a tail, um, and we're gonna have to put the cap on there. That's the the whole process. But let me show you a little bit how this works. So. There's our promoter region, there's our gene of interest, their Tata box, and we have our activators here. So what has to happen is that we have to have all of these enhancers um, turned on with their activators. And when they do that, this bending protein bends this around and starts the process of RNA polymerase going. And unless you have all those elements, it will not transcribe. And here's kind of the beauty of this system is that you don't need a um, you don't need the same organization that you have in um, say bacterial uh, genes where they're all lined up next to each other. What you have is just a series of available activators in every cell. And obviously, depending upon the environmental conditions, we may change the activators and certainly depending on the type of cell. So this is a set of activators that are available in one cell. This is a set of activators available in another. In another. Um, and what we have here is we have these um, activators turning on different genes. So here in a liver cell, we turn on the albumin gene, which is necessary for metabolism, but we don't turn on the crystalline gene, which is only necessary for I swear my dog never barks unless I'm making a video, so I apologize for that. <laughs> it's always when, we're, when I'm making a video. She barks like once a day. Um, and then um, we, so this crystalline is only necessary inside the eye, lens of an eye. So we only turn that gene on here. So depending on what these are, it determines what genes are turned on. It doesn't matter where they are in the DNA. They can be anywhere on any chromosome, but Anything that is activated by that set of activators will be turned on. So it's kind of a neat system. Um, 
We also have the idea of alternative RNA splicing. This is why uh, we think organisms like humans are so able to make such a, a vast quantity of proteins, even though we don't have the largest set of DNA, um, is that we can actually cut up our RNA differently and get different proteins. Um, a good example is an antibody. <clears throat> Antibodies have an, a region that is constant and then regions that are variable. And so we think that in many cases it's actually coded for by one gene, but depending on how we slice up the RNA, we'll get a slightly different version of the uh, antibody. <clears throat> we also um, know that there are these things called UTRs, which are untranslated regions um, that may actually affect both where the RNA is going and how long it lasts. And we also are just finding out about these things called microRNAs and small interfering RNAs. So MIRNAs and SIRNAs are what they were referred to. They, they can act to um, either help an RNA be coded, transcribed or translated, but it also can block it. And we don't completely understand this, but we are starting to understand their importance. Um, and we have these, um, the untranslated regions may block the ribosomes. Again, that turns off the gene. Um, we can also literally turn off the entire set of translation. We can basically turn off all ribosomes. This is a rare thing and obviously most cells would not want to do that because you do need to make certain proteins. Um, but it, can, it basically shuts down a cell. So this would be, obviously you would not want this for cells that you need active all the time, but some cells you can actually sort of switch off temporarily. And this would be important, especially in stressful situations. You simply have to conserve your energy. So we want to we shut down certain cells. <clears throat> um, this is showing you how we actually can block some of these. The, the, um, but I don't think that's that important. Um, we also can uh, have these things called proteasomes, and they're incredibly important in biology, and we, they don't get enough credit. We use them all the time in biotechnology. We, proteasomes are proteins that break down proteins, and I, I know that's a little strange, and there's a little irony there that you need a protein to break down proteins, but um, these are incredibly important inside the cell in the sense that once you make a protein, you need to eventually recycle that. And depending upon the cell, you may want to recycle it rather quickly. If you are cre creating that protein to respond to a very immediate need and it's a short-lived need, you don't need that protein hanging out for a long period of time. In other cells, you may not, you may want to slow that process down because you want those proteins to last for a long, long time. Um, so those are, are really, really important protein, uh, important proteins in the cells. Um, this is showing what a proteasome does. Here's our protein. Um, this is a tag that basically says this time to recycle. And then it goes in this proteasome. Boom. Uh, believe it or not, they use these proteasomes sometimes in cleaning products so that you can actually break down the proteins that might cause a stain, like blood or grass stain or something like that. Um, and one last little bit, <clears throat> cancer and gene regulation. So obviously cancer is a lack of gene regulation. And what ha often happens is you have these things called proto-oncogenes. Oncogenes are cancer genes. And the proto-oncogenes are the genes that are normal, but will possibly turn into cancer-causing genes. And that can happen in a whole number of ways, but mostly through mutation, but sometimes through viruses. Um, <clears throat> and um, one of the things that happens is that you have these tumor-suppressing genes, these things that help prevent cancer. And sometimes when you inactivate those, you lead to cancer. So that is a big problem as well. So this is showing you that a, um, a proto-oncogene is normal. These are the different ways it can become a, um, a 
oncogene. It could actually be um, translocated or tran transposition. So you're, you're moving it around within the DNA and it starts creating excess growth hormone. You could actually have the gene amplified, meaning that there's multiple copies of it, which means extra stimulus. And then it's, um, you could also mess up with the control element, okay? Or you could actually mess with the gene internally and create a 